Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what I hope the takeaways are today. Um, that uh, I, want, I want you guys to know that we are confident that we're, we're going to operate our camps this summer. Uh, we know that there's going to be some COVID mitigation things we'll need to do. Uh, that um, we are going to engage and share with you uh, our approved working assumption that we have made to help us plan. We'll go in to talk a little bit more about that. And these working assumptions should also help you prepare uh, for you, your units, and your families to attend our camps this summer. Um, and then uh, we want to also make sure that you understand a, a, renew, a commitment to maintain lines of communication uh, in the form of monthly uh, camping webinars um, as we move forward. And I'd like to hope that, that what we'll leave here with is that we understand any needs that you have that we fully uh, have anticipated and are prepared to, to, to be there for you and that we'll establish a baseline of trust and partnership moving forward um, so that we can truly do this camp process this summer together. Uh, so with that, we can go to the next slide. I wanna talk a little bit about um, what goes into managing risk um, from camp and, and scouting, and this really goes to anything. And, and for those of you who aren't you know, professional risk managers and, and others uh, that uh, do are, are constantly involved in doing this for your organization and whatnot, uh, this slide that I have up here talks about how you kind of, the, the relationship between the chance of harm or risk level and you know, your readiness, the things, the measures that you do to, uh, to make sure that, that, that you're going to be safe. And then um, the, the way that you evaluate and how you react to um, the, the, the relationship to the chance of harm and safety measures um, will determine your, your risk tolerance. And for some people, the risk tolerance may be uh, more along the lines of, I'm ready to accept more risk, which means is I don't need all the safety measures that are there because I have a greater um, comfort level or I have my comfort level is um, is, is not as strong here, and I want to have more uh, uh, safety measures in place. And so we're going to talk a little bit how, how we got to this place and how we're evaluating things, and really why it is that we're confident that camp is going to hop or operate this summer. Okay, next slide, Chris. Um, the, um, let's talk about um, you know, examples of uh, your day-to-day -day risk management. Right, so you're driving a car. You have to decide whether or not you're going to drive a car, and some factors may be in there. Is that you know the seatbelt? How reliable is that car? Will it stop when it says to stop, or does it have bad brakes, or or whatever? Um, and then all of a sudden, what's the weather like? You know, does that change the way that you look at how you might drive a car? Your tolerance for whether or not you want to go out. What if it gets icy out? The risk level goes up. What's your tolerance? Are you willing to drive in the ice? You know, do you put on chains? And so all of these things are, are risk, uh, chance of harm versus things the way that you, you might manage it. Swimming, you know, we do this office, you know, what's the temp of the water? What's your swimming experience? Is there a lifeguard? Are you swimming in the ocean? Are you swimming in a lake? All these things will change the way that you evaluate the, the danger of what you're doing, you know, getting on a ladder, how level's the ground, you know, have you ever cleaned the gutters before? All right, next slide. All those are just to kind of give you an idea to kind of analyze it, kind of what, what this slide here. Uh, let's take us back to about April of last year um, when I wasn't sleeping at night and um, my blood pressure was going through the weight through, and I literally weighed 30 pounds more than I do today. Um, and, um, and where we were at. So let's look at the factors that kind of uh, that, uh, affect the way that we look at the chance of harm and risk uh, for COVID. Um, one is the accuracy and availability of testing, right? Last April, it was very bad. We had no idea. Nobody had faith in the testing. Nobody had, had any understanding about, about how to get tested, where to go, and things like that. Today, it's better. Um, I don't think, I think I could get tested um, in the next day or two if I needed to without any, um, too much issue of, of trying to find it. And then we believe that by June, you know, um, getting tested would be as difficult as going to get gas. Um, and so, um, or somewhere along those lines. So that's kind of how we then let's talk about the availability of a vaccine. You know, there, obviously there was nothing last April, right? Today, 
there is available for a vaccine, but our, our availability is low. But by the time that June rolls around, we believe that there'll be moderate access to vaccines, that the common people will be able to get there. And then more importantly, those people who are most at risk for adverse reaction to COVID will have a, a chance of relief through a vaccine. Uh, the infection rates, you know, in April it was increasing. Right now it's off to scale high. We're more or less here in Oregon, if you're joining us by other places, we're pretty much as a state closed down, very limited interactions and, and things like that as we, um, are managing a, a, a spike in infections and death rate and hospital beds and, and like that. We believe that, that as we get closer to the summer, much like also what happened last year, but even more so um, based on the two things above, that we will have a much decreased um, level of uh, uh, rate of infection. And again, the death rates uh, were, were actually pretty low back in April and now, you know, we, we were down to like one or two people maybe, um, or, or actually, uh, you know, four people, five people maybe dying a, a week then to 60 people dying a day now. And, and, and that is affecting uh, things. But we do believe that through these efforts and, and a lot of changes we can expect in the next month or so, we're gonna see all those rates drop. Also remember how much we knew about the virus back in April and how much we know now and how much are we going to know it by June? I mean, it's leaps and bounds. And I think that anybody that has questions about testing and the vaccinations and, and availability and, 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 and treatments for, for the virus need to understand that in the next two or three months, we are going to become a whole nother degree more educated about, about how to be safe. And then um, what was our experience with uh, mitigating ourselves? I mean, remember at the beginning, don't wear a mask, <laughs> you know, but now we realize, hey, we need to wear a mask and, and uh, we have a pretty good um, understanding now. And, and as, the, as the resources and experts that we work with move forward, we're, we're feeling a much more stronger uh, 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 understanding of how to best provide mitigation as we move forward. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, so let's talk about the keys to our working assumptions. Number one, uh, all of you here today, our members highly desire a summer camp experience in 2021. I see people's Facebook posts, people email me, and they really want camp to happen. And you know what? We do too. Um, and, um, uh, and I think it's reasonable to assume uh, a summer camp experience based on the information I gave you before in the previous slide. All those things that we talked about means that the risk of infection will be slightly, what will be less than it was last summer. And our ability to prevent people from getting seriously ill will be significantly less. So our tolerance should be able to go up to be able to operate active uh, in, in a safe, um, clean and impactful way. Um, one thing we should say though, is that we do not, we have no illusions that this summer people won't be infected by the virus. We still need to protect ourselves and understand how to, how, how to interact with this virus in our community. We just know that the, our tolerance for um, how we do that is going to be, uh, be stronger. Um, and uh, the expro program experience uh, that we will, you will experience at, at camp will be different to accommodate these mitigation needs. And we're gonna talk more about that as we move forward. Um, let's go on the next slide. I should probably clarify at this point now, I'm gonna give you um, a 10,000 foot view of our working assumptions. And then I'm gonna introduce Chris Harold, who is our director of camping, who's working closely with our camp directors to put on this program um, and how he may, um, and the decision matrix that we're using and uh, more specifics as to what some of these are. But imagine coming to camp and your campsite group is your cohort or your unit is your cohort. What that mean by that is that is the group that you're allowed to interact with relatively freely, probably even without a mask, all right? These are your group that, that I mean, you'll be sleeping with, you'll be eating with, you'll be carpooling with, and, um, and you'll be able to interact with. Outside of that cohort, in every case, you will be required to be socially distanced and wear a mask for anything that you do while you're at camp. So, uh, and so that is, that is where we're thinking that we're going to be now. Um, also, 
I want you just so that you know how to prepare. We're going, we don't want everybody to arrive in the parking lot at the same time because we're going to create a situation for cross infection by doing that. So arrival times and start thinking about this now. How do you get all of your people to arrive on time at the same time? Because I guarantee you that there will be disappointed people that will have to go and park someplace out in the middle of nowhere until they can make it to their next arrival time, right? Um, that, because they, they missed one. Because we can't have you know 200 people, 300 people, 400 people showing up in a parking lot all at once. So expect that. Okay, next slide. All right, we're going to have pre-screening and testing. Um, we want to encourage all who can get vaccinated to do so, especially your high-risk individuals. And that is something we're gonna to talk to you as a responsibility for you. It's a state in, informed about how, to, how you might make that happen. If everybody that could be vaccinated was vaccinated, we would have a much higher risk tolerance than we would if we didn't. So uh, for those who are not vaccinated, um, we will be looking at uh, testing um, at camp, pre-camp, some sort of uh, pre uh, testing. And again, we will uh, most likely be having daily screenings with thermometers um, and, uh, rapid, and, and we'll have rapid testing uh, will be available uh, for, the, for those who come down with any illness. Okay, next, next slide. Um, food service. I, I, I point this out, we're going into a little bit more detail later, but uh, dining hall feeding being uh, in indoors, you know, and if those of you have been to camps before know that we jam you in there. And um, so we are recommending that, uh, that we will be operating shift feeding, which means everybody will not eat at once. That you'll have assigned tables that will be spaced out so that you'd be socially distanced from each, from each of the groups. And that, um, that you'll have to wear a mask whenever you're not seated at your table. Um, I didn't talk about ventilation and, and, and stuff that we'll also be doing there as well. And then, um, it, and then we'll have to sanitize the area uh, pretty well between use. Something to kind of expect. Uh, what does this mean to you is that it may affect the amount of time available to you to, that the program areas will be open because the, it's going to take longer for us to feed people than it used to. Next. Um, so uh, talk about the program, and Chris is going to go into far more, um, but um, imagine going to a merit badge activity um, where, um, uh, you know, everybody is wearing masks and sitting uh, socially distanced apart. Uh, we will not be wearing uh, masks inside the aquatics area. Uh, we'll talk more about, about what our mitigation steps will be in there later. Um, I didn't talk to a lot about Cub Scouts, but Cub Scouts will be put into these larger camp den groups, which is nothing new, but that camp den group will be their group for the week. They will eat with them. They'll go to program activities with them. Their free time will be at the same time and we be guided to certain areas. So they'll still be able to participate. It's just that they, they will not be, the, the idea of having the entire camp roaming around doing whatever they want at the same time is probably not gonna happen. Um, we're going to limit campwide activities um, uh, because of, of not so much the actual ac activity. I could probably socially distance all of you at a campfire or flag ceremony, but the process of getting you socially distant and, and in the right spaces will, one, take more time than anybody's willing to want to have and also push people into bunching. And, and, and we, were, we want to try to reduce cross infection. Um, also, we may be looking at limiting to merit badge size groups. Um, so more flexibility of participants to change merit badges or go to a different time. Um, also, we're recommending that you, um, that you don't go for eight merit badges this summer. This is not the year. We may not even let you. Um, that uh, we'll, we may need to reduce the amount of merit badges any one person can earn or work on during their week through merit badge classes. Next. All right. That is the overall view of um, where we are at um, and, and kind of uh, the, the big strokes of how we're planning for this next year. And there's still a lot of questions I'm sure you have with your specifics and other things. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Chris Harold. Um, I, uh, uh, Chris is an Eagle Scout from Portland. Chris and I worked together at Baldwin um, when we were kids. 
and uh, continued in scouting and have known each other this entire time. He worked in, as a BSA professional for a number of years and returned recently to lead our camping department. Um, he's had many years on summer camp staff and management in and out of this council. Um, he's also a certified educator, principal, and child care director. Um, uh, was kind of where we, we got him from um, in, in the middle times and uh, has been very involved in, in, in many different access with uh, camping organizations and safety organizations to help make camp happen. And Chris's role is that he works directly with all the camp directors um, to uh, put on the camps that you will see this summer and uh, developing, taking this big assumption and, and managing it on the ground. So with that, take it away, Chris. Thanks, Todd. Well, uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's interesting to think about each of these working assumptions that we have as a kind of a graphic equalizer. If you've ever run a soundboard, if you ever had one of those old fashioned stereos that had all the little slider things that went up and down, depending on where you set those depends on the sound that comes out of your, out of your stereo. Well, similar to that, <clears throat> similar to that, our working assumptions and where we set them help you do some planning, they make they help us do some planning, and they get us on a page where we can adjust our sound to meet the conditions that, that are uh, going on in our world right now. Um, currently, we have about 4,500 youth with reservations to come to camp this next summer for both our Cub Scout and Boy Scout uh, overnight camps. Uh, it's a in five different camps, and it's kind of a daunting enterprise, but I wanna reassure you on so many fronts, um, Next slide, please. That our returning camp directors, um, which four out of our five camp directors are returning, um, and and quite a few key staff um, are returning. They're coming back with a summer of some experience of doing the family camping programs and some of the cohort camping programs that we were able to operate this summer. Um, the importance of that is. Um, they have experience in the, many of those mitigation measures on the right side of this slide here. They know how to manage these items um, so that they so, so that they can help keep people as safe as possible and keep the risk as low as possible. So that's pretty exciting uh, to report that we've got that that kind of experience coming back for our, for you for this and for us <laughs> for this next summer. I want to um, also describe before getting into some of the uh, little details of things, important little details of things, the research and experience that have gone on from March till now. Um, some of these, I'm gonna elaborate some of these points on the left um, in some detail, um, just because I want you to know that this isn't just me and the Todd and I show trying to make up things. <laughs> this is to, to get by. This is everything we're doing is based on deep research and uh, communication throughout the board to get the best information we can as soon as possible. Um, the group that sets the Oregon state guidance um, at the state level um, from the governor's office that's a group we're in communication with regularly in two ways, both directly, but also as part of a, a consortium of camps. Uh, the two, two, um, two groups, one's the CCCA, uh, it's Christian Camps primarily, and one the ACA, American Camp Association. Those two groups in Oregon are collaborating to speak as much as possible with one voice so that the guidance issued to camps fits all our different situations. Um, for example, some camps are strictly, you know, bunkhouse, small, small cabin kind of camps. Um, some camps have no adults except for the staff that's there. Our camps have volunteer adult leaders, a camp staff, and a lot of outdoor sleeping. So the, some of the rules, some of the rules need to be sure to apply to all our different camps and our offerings. And so that these groups are working with our state officials to make sure that that happens appropriately. And we've had great communication in the process. And that's, yeah, so there's that. Second, the American Camp Association commissioned an outside environmental firm with expertise in many, in, in, in these sorts of things to plan a field guide um, for all camps to use. 
And that field guide gets it gets into great detail about how do you clean things in say a aquatics area? How do you manage that facility so that you keep people safe during this COVID time? Um, that field guide gets into tons of detail about anything from dining to transportation. It's got chapter after chapter and it's a living document. As new information comes forth, they're adding to it. Um, it's based in research. I was actually able to read at least four of the research studies from camps that operated successfully last summer. Um, and what, what they think made those camps operate successfully, what guidelines they lived under. It goes into quite some detail. In fact, they were, they're also doing research on camps that operated but had issues and trying to tie down where did these issues come from um, so that we can go into this next summer armed with what works and what does not and with professional recommendations that go well, well deeply beyond me and Todd. <laughs> the, uh, our national BSA has an outdoor programs department who's been wonderful about um, letting us know when there's webinars we need to be at to get this information update by directly feeding us information we need to have and by setting forth BSA guidelines as well. Locally, we have a COVID panel that Todd mentioned before. It's made up of parents, of volunteers, of physicians, of people who are safety specialists. Um, and I know that I'm going through a lot of detail in this, but I don't know that I can quite go to enough <laughs> from, this, from this perspective. This is not cobbled together. This is some deep, deep study um, to make sure that we're making our best decisions um, for our kids' behalf. Um, and, and so I guess I just wanted to underline that point strongly. Next slide, please. Now we get to some specifics. So for each of these sliders that you see, it's kind of like that graphic equalizer I described. We've put a star about where we think our working assumptions are today. And given our current conditions, where we think we'll be for summer. Um, we've broken it down into some, uh, what was that term that we used for that? There were some, just into the, some key areas. Um, and this, this is actually widely agreed upon in, in different camps about how, how, how these things might, uh, what, what these key areas are that we'll have to make some decisions. Um, so let's start with staffing. Um, when we staff our summer camp, we are, we are thinking that, um, we may need some more staff. Um, we may need some more staff um, to, to do some most of the regular things, but also to handle a lot of these mitigation measures, these cleaning items, these um, management of the food service. We may need some. So our ability to offer program is based on our ability to find enough of the right kind of staff and get them trained and up and running in time for camp to start. Um, so, so that's one challenge that lies in front of us, but we're confident that we can do that, particularly with your help in sending us um, staff age youth um, to work at our camps. As, as Chris mentioned at the top of the, uh, top of the hour, it may be one of the only shows in town for, for uh, uh, teenagers this summer is to be on camp staff to earn money for their, for their summer employment, but it's an awesome one. And that was a whole different webinar <laughs> on camp staffing. Um, the second item is on food service, on food service. Um, Todd mentioned that briefly as well. We think the most likely thing is that we will have some form of shift feeding in our, in our um, camps with the exception as was noted in the chat of Camp Baldwin where you're your own cook and cleaner and bottle washer. And in that, in that situation, um, you know, you've got, um, you're operating your own food service in, in a way um, with the food and materials we provide. Um, but shift feeding is probably the most likely thing. So you'll have an assigned time to be at the dining hall with assigned tables and seats. Um, odds, uh, they are saying that the most, um, the safest way to, to serve food is to do pre-plated or cafeteria style where, where um, you don't have people running down the row on a buffet touching all the items. It's, it's, it's individuals serving the amounts, ser serving the uh, portions out. Um, so that's, I mean, 
that's a difference from what our normal camps are, but it's, um, it's not dramatic. I don't think it's, it's just different. Right. Um, and, and what will, what that would do is lower the capacity of, of how many people are in the dining hall at the same time and allow for more airflow and cleaning time in between, uh, serving times. Um, the second option there is that there would be anywhere from some to all of the meals that were in the site, either delivered to the site or cooked in the site. Um, we're, that's that we're holding as a backup option, but um, there might be some blended amount of that where, where you have some of your meals in the dining hall and some of the meals delivered to your site. All of these things are set to, to keep the capacity down and, and allow us to continue to keep the cleaning and the, uh, and the spacing um, that, that we may are likely to need for whatever capacity we can serve. Next slide. Cohorting likewise has about two options where you can see where our working assumption lies on that continuum. Um, we're presuming that we're, it's pretty likely we'll be able to do cohorting on the unit level. So your whole troop would be together. Uh, your whole troop would be together in a cohort in a campsite. Um, and that, and you arrive and you participate primarily at that troop level. Um, with all the activities, with any of these plans, the three things that, are, that, that we need to keep in mind are the spacing, the masking, and the outdoors. If you've got two of those things in place, you've got most of your mitigations already done. If we can maintain those things, we've got most of our mitigation done. Um, the second level would be something used by some camps this last summer is, is smaller cohorts. Um, it's again, less likely we think, but that would be groups of about roughly 10 youth and two adults. Um, you arrive in that group, you travel from wherever you're coming from in that group, um, that you do your program while you're at camp in that group. Meaning that if you're a large troop, you might be able to have your younger kids in one cohort primarily. So they could do most or mostly younger kid activities. Or if you had a blended cohort, it would give a leadership opportunity for your older scouts in particular. Um, but you would travel from area to area in that cohort. Um, it would not, the key difference there is I think our scouts are accustomed to uh, meandering around camp kind of at will. That would be a whole different Idaho if uh, if we had to resort to the uh, smaller cohorts, um, and it would be a, it would be a more what much more significant change um, compared to what we do already. That cohort would have probably assigned staff support that smaller cohort, so that you would have a staff person or two who probably did most of your instruction and would probably require our adult leaders to take a role in that as well. But we'll get into the, that in the program side a little more. Camp capa capacities is maybe one of the largest question marks at this point. We're presuming we're going to have between 80 to, to full capacity of campers for this next summer. Um, we think a fallback option would be about 50% capacity. And in that case, we would need to consider how to adjust um, the campsites and the property so that they would fit those people how to adjust the season so that everybody who wants to come can come to camp. Uh, one option there is the possibility of adjusting the adults that are allowed to come along um, because we want that, one, it's fewer people that would be exposing and needing to um, move through camp. And, um, and second, it would allow more youth to come. So camp capacity is another question mark and all that. Uh, next slide. Um, we think that one of the areas of great change, the greatest change will be in sanitization, use of PPE and health monitoring. This is some of the screening, testing and cleaning um, that was talked about a little bit earlier. Um, we think there will, will be some, there is definitely going to be some form of pre-screening um, and there may be an additional, there may be additional screenings in camp, something like a daily health check uh, done at the unit level or cohort level. Um, the COVID testing that is pre-camp or at camp is another question mark of, of what, might, what you might expect uh, for summer. Masking almost certainly 
um, I would I would plan on masking. In fact, I would plan if there's one thing you can lean on right now, get your make sure your youth and adults are coming with a full complement of masks so they can change them out um, a day, daily and then also um, when they get lost, as they inevitably will, because those will not be lost and found items that we're going to keep around. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, the quarantining is an open question at this point, but pr prior to coming to camp, one of the effective strategies is that that groups quarantine before they come to camp. And then when you go back to camp to prevent community spread, you don't, you, you also quarantine again um, for whatever the required amount of time is, which has also been something that's been moving a moving target here recently. Um, there, one thing we found very effective ourselves and saw across the country as very effective is assigned spaces, um, particularly for, uh, well, for eating, of course, but but also for restroom and shower use. Um, fortunately, already on the books prior to COVID was our uh, shower house projects that have been coming along. Um, so that there are individual stalls of shower houses at each of our camps. And that, that's pretty cool because it allows us to say this group uses this toilet, shower, sink space only. So you're keeping within your cohort for that. Um, and likewise, the outhouses, um, the flushing out houses that we have at our camps would be assigned to a certain group and cleaned way more regularly if they're not assigned to a certain group. Um, so there's some of that. Program areas, this, so now we're going for a long stretch of program things. We've got about uh, five, five sliders related to program. Uh, we want to keep program as close to what you know, know and recognize as possible. That's what we desire to do. Um, doing that in this environment is a challenge. So let's, let's go into that a little. So, um, the program areas, what program areas we offer, um, the, the biggest factor there is what capacity our camps are allowed to have and what style of cohorting we're expected to do. If, if we have the smaller cohorts, it's probably gonna mean a more limited program menu. It's going to, it is going to mean a more limited program menu. Um, and if we have a reduced capacity similar um, to that, um, it'll, it'll limit our program menu. So that would slide it to the right. Um, so there's that. Next slide, please. I'm noticing a lot of uh, familiar names on this call and I'm grateful for that. So um, merit badge classes. Um, again, our working assumption where the star is there is you know about three quarters there. We're thinking that it'll be three quarters normal. So if you're coming in a unit and we're able to go to classes um, semi-normally, you would be that your scouts would be wearing masks um, when they go to their merit badge classes and maintaining social distancing. Um, and then if it's cohort classes, if we have to do the smaller cohorts, then it would be more would be done in your campsite um, and. Um, the cohort classes um, would also be done with masking and your staff who was working with you, of course, would be masked and distanced as well. So that would be the merit badge classes and how they might be different. Um, the attractions, by these I mean the out of camp things, the trips to the whitewater rafting or the um, um, kayaking. Um, each camp's got its own outside camp attractions. And I will, I will say that there are some additional tricks to doing those off-site attractions. Um, you're, doing, you're going out into the community, um, there's driving to a range and whatever restrictions may be around that. And so that, for that reason, we're saying that's probably going to be one of the earlier things to go because it also requires staff to go along with. And, um, and so that would take the staff away for a small group versus um, having them serving the larger group community of camp. So that's, that's attractions. What else we got there? Next slide. Equipment is another one. We're for sure going to require more cleaning of our equipment. Um, think of things like the climbing ropes and 
how do you how do you do things between users? Um, the aquatics gear you've got different people holding the oars or the paddles or the um, you know climbing in and out the boats. Uh, you're putting on a, a full face bike helmet to go down on the mountain bikes, and now you've been breathing in that for a half hour, and you got to make sure that's good and disinfected. There's a lot of disinfection, and fortunately, there's a lot of good advice in in these professional organizations of how to do some of this but it's definitely time intensive and it would mean we need to either do smaller groups or less access to some of those equipment intensive activities. And pretty much one of the best things about camp is that you get to do a lot of hands-on things, but those hands-on things are gonna require us to do a lot more hand sanitization and, and um, sanitizing of everything else as well. So, so use of equipment is, gonna, is going to be um, our ability to use the equipment and access the equipment is going to be directly tied to, do we have enough staff to keep it clean um, and keep it regularly cleaned um, so that it can be used safely. Camp-wide activities and games, that's another area where, you're, where you are very likely to see significant change. Um, in the camp-wide activities and games, you, that's things like campfire, chapel, flag ceremonies, um, camp-wide games, um, some, some of the biggest challenges to mitigation are when people are in those groups together, even, even outdoors when you bring people close together, a large group of people together, that's, that's one of the most challenging parts to mitigate. It's likely those things would be, some of those camp-wide games and activities would look different so that we're not gonna bring all of camp together in one place. It's very unlikely we'll bring all of camp together in one place. Um, so a little bit more about that. I mean, it's singing, that, yell, yelling, and group gatherings. Those are kind of the big challenges there. Um, but we have some workarounds. Uh, one good example came from our experiences last summer at Butte Creek Scout Ranch, where we had day activities only. The, um, the skeleton crew that we had there prepared a notebook of activities. Hey, baby! So uh, we had we had that um, just a second, Chris. One second here. We are going to stop the share here because hold on one second. <laughs> I'm going to have you, Chris, unmute yourself. Got it. That sounds good. Yeah. So we're, we're we're taking Give care. You. Now, of the challenge. Here. Yes, the challenge. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yay. Somebody not so scouty apparently is here. <laughs> I didn't mean to sound so boring. <laughs> All right. So, um, so the camp that's, we were on camp white activities and the fact that we'll very likely have to do, um, have to have to do those differently. But at Butte Creek, they were able to have guidebooks at each at each family site that had a had activities and how to do them anything from and you could do a, a camp wide game that way with the instructions to the camp wide game right there on the site what's the scavenger hunt how do you earn points for this that or the other there's ways to do it um you could have the resources of um how to do a scout's own chapel service how to do um the, the, the flag ceremonies a variety of flag ceremonies in your own troop site uh campsite so there are options for us to do that. It does take away uh, something that we're accustomed to with the full gatherings of camp and the fire, enthusiasm and fire that comes out of that. We're on camp wide activities and the fact that we'll very likely have to do um, have to have to do those differently. But at Butte Creek, they were able to have guidebooks at each at each family site that had a had activities and how to do them anything from and you could do a, a camp wide game that way with the instructions to the camp wide game right there on the site what's the scavenger hunt how do you earn points for this that or the other there's ways to do it um, you could have the resources of um, how to do a scout's own chapel service how to do um, the, the flag ceremonies a variety of flag ceremonies in your own troop site uh, campsite so there are options for us to do that. It does take away uh, something that we're accustomed to with the full gatherings of camp and the fire, enthusiasm and fire that comes out of that. But it, that is an area where it's, it's real difficult to do it um, in, in a way that meets the standards that we've seen and what keeps people as safe as possible. 
so basically just to reiterate that we are making these decisions, working these assumptions based on research about what works in, our, in camps and what worked last summer. In the ACA field guide that gives very explicit area by area instructions of what works and how to do it. And third, on, and on making those things all apply to our camps and what areas of camps and what ages of kids we're serving. So um, those are the key things there. Um, and Todd, we're up to the what we need from you slide, or maybe we want to do, and then questions, or do you want to do questions first? Um, I'll go ahead and, and talk about that, and then because the last real slide before we or, before we um, just open up the questions, and we have been answering questions throughout. Um, as we go. So, a <clears throat> um, couple things I want to share, uh, just in in that. Thank you, Chris, so much for all the work that you and your team are doing. You know, there's a lot of questions we have in here, like what are we going to do about water bottles and and the like that um, are not. Um, um, are not uh, things that we've decided yet. You know, how are we gonna do filling stations and things? Those are some of the, the logistical details that come with a little bit more uh, uh, collaboration from our camp directors. Know that we just recently approved this working assumption and handed it to our camp directors who are just now uh, taking it and developing um, their plans. Uh, I, I think that it would be remiss at, for me not to share that we actually have a backup plan that we're working on, um, but we haven't really, a lot of the pieces of it are in um, what uh, what Chris talked about, um, and, and but we, we don't wanna share more than one working assumption. And so we, but just to let you know, as Chris could show you is that we have this nice scale of, of how things could look this summer, but we do believe that what we shared is a good anchor uh, to tether ourselves to as we plan moving forward. And so um, now as we, what do we need from you? Um, and I would say that the key things are, um, uh, we really could use your help to update your uh, projected numbers that you're attending uh, at camp. Frankly, since we rolled over so many reservations from last year, we found several of them that are no longer units. <laughs> and so uh, we need to go through and identify um, uh, in between now and March 1 or so, um, what units are, are uh, still planning on coming. But really, if you could let us know how many you're planning on bringing and updating those numbers, that's important. Know that we did not change the, the payment deadline of March 1st for Scout VSA units. We did change it for Cub Scout packs. Cub Scouts, uh, the same deadline of $100 per Scout isn't until April. And what that deadline is, is that if you have 10 kids registered, you owe a thousand bucks. And so no matter what, that thousand is non-refundable. All right. And so the reason that is, is that we want you to commit so that, um, that one, we know that one, you're paying attention and two, that we can bet best plan as well. Um, also, uh, you know, throughout the whole process, maintain a communication and collaboration with us as we go. Um, we are planning on monthly webinars, um, so stay tuned. You all who attended this one, except for the people who were naughty, uh, will be invited to the next one. Um, and uh, uh, the um, and so we want to make sure that we maintain regular communication through these webinars. And also, our camping department stands ready to assist you at any time. Um, Jeanette, Deanne, uh, Chris, Jennifer, myself um, are there for you uh, to help Looking at um, some questions, Chris Bartell, you added those from Facebook, I take it? Great. Uh, dietary needs, we've been getting better and better at that um, over the years. Um, and in fact, most of our camps have a, a uh, special needs cook on the kitchen staff. Um, so those are communicated. There's a, there's a form available in advance of camp um, as part of the program. Um, to communicate directly what those special needs are. Um, the camp then contacts each, each family um, to make sure we've got those right, where there's, especially where there's questions or it's not clear. Um, so that's, that's something that we're, we're quite skilled at, is meeting special needs um, for dietary needs. 
By the way, um, only in very rare situations and maybe even less so, do we allow anybody outside of our cooking um, people inside the kitchen proper. Um, and so, um, and that is something that our local health authorities have, have asked us to do as well. So it's not just an us thing. Um, and also to try to protect them, you know, if our entire kitchen staff gets sick or has an issue, um, then that, that affects uh, everybody. So I, I noticed that that was in there. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, required to be immunized, um, um, I think uh, highly recommended. There may be an extra cost if you don't. Currently, it cost me 60, uh, 30 bucks to, to test you at camp. My guess is that'll be much less. Um, and as we know more about uh, entering in discussions about testing at camp um, and requirements from the state, we can, we can, we can fully better answer that. Um, it is our hope um, that, I, me personally, I'd like to, even if I have to figure out how to pay for it, to immunize our entire camp staff. Um, and because uh, uh, that makes your, I mean, makes camp safer. And, um, uh, also protects our employees. So. Awesome. We just did have a nice plug there for camp staff. I threw it in the chat. <laughs> Christina says that Pablo says it's the best job ever. So there you go. And I know we, we've had a couple of kids from our troop uh, boys that have, they've actually, they were actually planning on going back this last summer because they went two summers ago. So they, and they loved it. And even one of the one of the scouts was, uh, he had just joined. He'd only been in scouts for a couple of years, but he was older and he was 16. He's like, I want to do this. And he, it was a blast. I mean, they had, they were at Merriweather and they loved it. So. And Chris, you don't have to be a scout. Great. I mean, we'll make you a scout and we'll register you. <laughs> in but fact, uh, we have, we literally have people each year show up with us that, uh, and help us. Uh, and, and, I mean, we registered them, but they were, they were never a scout. Maybe we could have some scouting influence on our on our Zoom busters there to uh, yes. run, work in our STEM area. They have some coding <laughs> skills. I think. Got, they've got hey, skills. Uh, Chris is, uh, we had a question here about Cub Scout camps. I'd like to, to jump in on. Oh yeah. What does the ratio for Cubs look like? Well, think of if you've been to camp that you'll be assigned a campsite. In that campsite, there'll be a roughly around ten kids and probably ten adults, and that group will be uh, your assigned group for the week. Um, the backup for that may be that that group will be in half. So it'll be five uh, youth and five adults will be assigned to a group and that group will interact. Um, we're leaning towards the bigger groups at this stage. Um, uh, a lot of the camps have opportunities for this kind of free time where you just kind of roam around and do everything. Um, and uh, we, we, we believe that that may be significantly reduced um, or removed. Um, your, your cohort will have access to a certain level of things uh, uh, in a free time way and another groups will have other ones. So we just kind of re reduce the, the bunching as best we can. Um, um, Great. You know, we did have somebody ask a question about Butte Creek and the good news is that yes, although they were wondering about uh, what happens with all the rebuilding efforts and things like that? Will it be ready? And I believe the plan is that we'll be ready to rock and roll for Butte Creek, for camping at Butte Creek. Am I correct? That is correct. And also, I'm excited that, that all of you will finally, uh, if you haven't experienced yet, our brand new shower houses at each one of the camps, your own stall, your own room, your own place to put your stuff. Um, and uh, the ability to have a flushable uh, outhouse. Um, it will be something that will be common to all of our, our uh, so the smell will be way down, the cleanliness will be way up. Um, we are excited that we, one thing that you will experience, and this would have been COVID or not COVID, but a much safer, cleaner, and, and impactful program than what we have experienced in the past. And I think really, Todd, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's always our target in our camps, that, are, that they're safe for our participants, that they're clean to, to ever increasing standards, to be quite honest, compared to when you and I started. <laughs> 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 and impactful and, and yeah, impactful is, is, I mean, that that's our why, right? That's why we're all here. So thank you all for taking time to be here today. It's um, 
it's a big ask this year, maybe more than ever, um, to to do this kind of preparation. But it's a it's it's a wonderful team we're all on to be able to pull it off, and we we are coming at it with a much more confidence than this last summer. Right. Sounds and great. Uh, I really appreciate it, everybody. I think that's all that we have. Chris put our emails in the um, in the uh, chat. Um, I'm looking at a lot of you. You see us. And if I can just say the last thing as, as we end, remember, we, we look at our role with you as we prepare for our summer as a partnership, that um, your concerns are our concerns. And if you ever feel like we don't feel like your concerns are that way, please challenge us on that because uh, they are. And um, your, the solutions to your problems are our solutions. And so we, we need to work together as, and, and not everything will be the way that we would like it, but together we will come up with good solutions. And, um, and, and we are, look forward to have that relationship with you as we move forward. Uh, Chris Barchell, thank you for hosting these. Chris Harrell, thank you very much uh, for all you do and, and for all of you today. Thank you for making a difference in the lives of kids on a daily basis. You're here. Thanks for joining us, gang. Have a great afternoon, and, and thanks for your patience today. <laughs> Have a good one. Bye-bye.